the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. In a television interview back in 1965, Julius Robert Oppenheimer shared his thoughts on a question that weighed heavily on his mind. It was about the successful Trinity nuclear bomb test. Oppenheimer's response was both poignant and profound, underlining the reality that atomic weapons rank among the scariest creations ever invented by humankind. With tens of thousands of nuclear warheads scattered across our globe, our world exists in a constant shadow cast by the specter of atomic warfare. The threat looms large, capable of erasing entire civilizations in its wake. The nuclear bomb stands as the ultimate instrument of death. Its power is unmeasurable. Tragically, its own father was overcome with fear at the potency of his own invention. Oppenheimer, having witnessed the devastation unleashed upon Hiroshima and Nagasaki, became haunted by the destructive capabilities of his brainchild. The nuclear bomb was no ordinary invention. It also cast a dark cloud over Robert Oppenheimer's life. So what exactly is the relationship between him and his terrifying invention that led him directly to the worst part of his life? Let's reveal this secret with FameQuest TV. Don't forget to watch this video until the end to find out the answer. Let's dive into the intriguing story of Robert Oppenheimer, starting with his childhood. Born on April 22, 1904 in New York, he came into a Jewish family with deep roots. The Oppenheimers originally hailed from Germany, but by 1888 they've immigrated to America. His father, Julius, began as a textile importer, arriving in the new land with nothing but his talents and determination. Over time, he transformed that start into prosperity. Ella, his mother, was a painter from Baltimore. The family settled into an apartment on the 11th floor of 155 Riverside Drive, Manhattan, in 1912. Growing up in a privileged environment and with parents who were both accomplished and educated, young Oppenheimer's focus was directed toward education in various spheres. He commenced his studies at the Alcuin Preparatory School, moving on to the School of Sociocultural Ethics in 1911. It's worth noting that Oppenheimer was a bright student, his interest spanning literature, English and French languages, and even mineralogy. His intellect shone particularly bright, evident when he managed to complete both the third and fourth grades within a single year. He even skipped eighth grade, a testament to his rapid progression. In his later years of high school, chemistry captured his interest and passion. Upon entering Harvard in 1922, Oppenheimer embarked on a journey, not only into chemistry, but also through history, literature, philosophy, and mathematics, as requirements set by the school. Due to his health problem, he entered a year later than his peers. To make up for the time, he took on a tight schedule of six classes each term. It's remarkable that in his very first year, he managed to ace a postgraduate physics exam through self-study. This allowed him to bypass the basics and dive into advanced courses. It was a thermodynamics class, taught by the renowned physicist Percy Bridgman, that set Oppenheimer on a trajectory towards experimental physics. In a mere three years, he graduated with honors, earning him the chance to take his studies and research to Europe for further advancement. Let's go back to 1924 when Oppenheimer's academic adventure took him to Christ College, a part of Cambridge University. He reached out to a famous scientist, Ernest Rutherford, asking to work at the Cavendish Laboratory. 
Bridgman also wrote a letter of recommendation for Oppenheimer, but noted he was a bit clumsy in experiments, suggesting his talent was more in theoretical physics than experimental physics. Although Rutherford wasn't overly impressed, Oppenheimer still went to Cambridge, hoping for a chance. Eventually, a well-known physicist named J.J. Thompson agreed to take Oppenheimer under one condition. He had to learn some basic lab skills. However, the person in charge of teaching him, Patrick Blackett, and Oppenheimer didn't get along at all. In fact, it became so strained that Oppenheimer later revealed he once spiked apples with toxic chemicals and left them on Patrick's desk. Luckily, no one took a bite. Oppenheimer was seriously talented in physics, but he had his share of struggles. He smoked a lot, often skipped meals when engrossed in his work, and was frequently consumed by bouts of depression. This worried his family and friends, making them think he had some serious mental issues. But Oppenheimer didn't seem to care much about that. He focused so much on physics that he didn't have many friends. He even told his brother that he needed physics more than friends. In 1926, Oppenheimer departed Cambridge to pursue studies at the University of Göttingen under the guidance of Max Born, a prominent German physicist and mathematician. At that time, Göttingen was a hub of theoretical physics globally, and it was here that Oppenheimer's path intersected with future luminaries like Werner Heisenberg, Pascal Jordan, Wolfgang Pauli, Paul Dirac, Enrico Fermi, and Edward Teller. Oppenheimer's brilliance continued to shine, and his enthusiasm sometimes overflowed into fervent debates. Roughly a year into his time here, at the age of 23, he secured his PhD under Max Born's mentorship. The year in Göttingen also saw him contribute significantly to the realm of quantum mechanics. With all his success in Europe, Oppenheimer came back to the United States in 1927 and started his teaching and research journey. The next phase of Oppenheimer's journey as he carved out his career in the United States. Following his return to the U.S. in September 1927, Oppenheimer secured a research fellowship from the U.S. National Research Council at Caltech. Interestingly, his former teacher Bridgman was also keen on having him at Harvard. After a bit of back and forth, a compromise was reached. Oppenheimer would spend one year at Harvard, specifically with the class of 1927, and then transition to Caltech with the class of 1928. In the autumn of 1928, he had an opportunity to come to Leiden University in the Netherlands, where he met Paul Ehrenfest, a renowned Austrian theoretical physicist. His journey didn't stop there. He continued to the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich to collaborate with another Austrian physicist, Wolfgang Pauli. Their work delved into the intricate fields of quantum mechanics and continuum spectroscopy. This relatively short period played a pivotal role in boosting Oppenheimer's reputation and amplifying his innate talents, thus significantly enhancing his career trajectory. Upon returning to the United States, Oppenheimer embraced a position as an associate professor at the University of California, Berkeley, while also continuing his teaching role at Caltech. His tenure at Berkeley was marked by remarkable achievements and the ascent of his reputation to an idol-like status among his students. The breadth of his knowledge and his deep understanding earned him admiration from students and colleagues alike. It's worth noting that Oppenheimer's demeanor shifted. He could be incredibly warm and animated during discussions, yet appear distant and aloof in crowded environments. This dichotomy contributed to the impression that he was a somewhat detached and cold genius. However, his unique personality and underlying mental struggles also evoked mixed feelings. For some, they considered him a cocky and somewhat dangerous man. But interestingly, most students found themselves drawn to him, to the extent that they tried to emulate his gait, his way of speaking, and even his work habits. As time marched forward, Oppenheimer's career rocketed ahead. By 1936, he had attained the prestigious rank of full professor a feat accompanied by an annual salary of $3,300, a substantial sum equating to nearly $70,000 in today's terms. Within the realm of research, Oppenheimer garnered a treasure trove of accomplishments spanning a multitude of fields. His contributions were as diverse as they were significant. From pivotal breakthroughs in theoretical astronomy, particularly within the realms of general relativity and nuclear theory, to nuclear physics, spectroscopy, and quantum field theory, he left an indelible mark. 
and it didn't stop there. He seamlessly extended his exploration into the realm of quantum electrodynamics. A distinctive facet of Oppenheimer's character was his insatiable curiosity and interest in a wide array of domains, not confined solely to the scientific realm. A case in point, in 1933, he embarked on the journey of studying Sanskrit. This linguistic adventure led him to read the original Sanskrit text of the Bhagavad Gita, a work he considered pivotal in shaping his philosophical outlook on life. However, as Oppenheimer's career surged forward, the world was gradually descending into the tumultuous vortex of World War II. And it was amidst this global chaos that his life took an entirely unexpected turn. It all began when he became a key player in what would become the most renowned project of his life, the Manhattan Project. And there you have it, a glimpse into the early years of the brilliant physicist Robert Oppenheimer. A portrait emerges of his extraordinary talent and visionary prowess within the realm of physics. But there's an intriguing puzzle at hand. Why does a figure like him bear two seemingly paradoxical titles, hero and destroyer? A World War hero, yet the destroyer of worlds. The answers to these enigmatic titles will be unveiled in the forthcoming episode of the Oppenheimer series on FameQuest TV. Don't miss a beat. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to FameQuest TV to ensure you stay updated on all our latest episodes.